if, if one of the major intentions in making sacred spaces that we've been looking at was to embody the mystery and oneness and boundlessness and benevolence of God, a second was to create a, a, a journey from the earthly everyday to, to heavenly light. A third impulse was to exemplify something of God's perfect immutable harmony. And this is the topic for today's talk. I'm going to introduce it very briefly, probably shamefully briefly, through the classicism of Greece and Rome. And then moving to the Renaissance in Italy, we'll examine the efforts at achieving this harmony on the basis of the very ordered language of antiquity and through mathematics. We'll look at how the quest for perfection in that period meant that architects had to go back to the model of the centralized church with its dome as a symbol of God's perfection. And that meant that they also had to deal with making the longer, more functional church perfect. Added to this, they felt they had to get it all to work within this Greek and Roman classical language, which was a given perfectly harmonious architecture. Their concerns with the dome and with perfection will take us again into Islam, where there was a concurrent development of a new kind of mosque with similar aims at perfect harmony. And finally, in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and in the Taj Mahal in Agra, we will look at the spatial role played by what I call the elevated plane in reaching the goal of that still unchanging unity and harmony. The goal was achieved architecturally in a seminal way in ancient Greece. And it's interesting that the layout of the ancient Greek temenos or sacred enclosure, enclosure doesn't look harmonious at all, but rather arranged piecemeal uh, over time, like a farmer might lay out a farmyard. However, there are several theories about how they were laid out. And although the authors come from very different angles, they do all assume, because it was Greek, that behind the design of the Temenos there are rules. They just don't agree on the rules. One says there are in the way the buildings are orientated towards natural phenomena. One that they lie in visual spatial composition. A third says that they obey complex mathematical laws. But whatever their differences there, they certainly would agree that the design of the temple itself, which housed the image of the God, was intended to and did achieve a quality of perfect harmony and permanent stability. Its main parts echo the form of a person standing solid on the ground. Base, feet, middle, body, top, head. There are six columns across the front, the highest number one can perceive at a glance, and the five spaces between the columns make a balanced symmetry about the middle space, the entry. There's a balanced relationship between the positive column and the negative space between, such that if you, if you change one, you need to change the other. And the corner uh, and, at, uh, uh, and the outside columns are slightly closer to their neighbors to help the corners feel strong. The columns, as I'm sure you know, are not all vertical, but tilt imperceptibly inward to reinforce the sense of stability. The columns themselves are thicker at the bottom than at the top, so that they feel firmly rooted. And they're shaped with a slight bulge known as entesis thus con conveying a sense of load carrying and the capitals too bulge as if cushioning the load. The fluting of the columns conveys a sense of the forces of gravity being carried to the ground and so on. Many, many devices are used to create a building of perfect unchanging harmony. In my mind, these temple builders made something like a natural phenomenon, say like an oak tree, 
An oak tree, while it may not be a perfect example because it's in poor soil or in a windy spot, is always an oak tree. Its different parts, trunk, branches, roots, leaves, always work together in the same way. It's something absolute. And in the same way, the temple at, of Hera and Pistum, which is a sturdy, powerful, slightly archaic looking building, and that of the temple of Hephaestus in Athens, a more elegant, more gentle, more feminine building, are variations of an essential phenomenon which is absolute, unchanging and eternal. And of course, the most refined version is the Parthenon, which has everything in perfect balance, even though, ironically, it breaks the rule with its eight columns instead of, uh, instead of six across the front. Now, this temple front was a most incredible invention. No wonder. Um, sorry. No wonder it has continued to appear for 2,500 years. Whenever somebody wa has wanted to project to the world their absolute godlike perfection and permanence, such as the King's Palace in 17th century France in the Louvre, the United States President's Palace, the White House, UCT's main assembly hall, or a $36 million private house in Cape Town. And it's no wonder that all the thinking developed by the Greeks was absorbed into Roman culture. The Romans expanded on it by finding ways to apply it to two to four story building structures made with arches and vaults like the Colosseum. And the Colosseum and the way that it's organized in these four stories and the way that the orders of architecture are used vertically and horizontally up in relation to those arches became a model for literally hundreds and hundreds of Renaissance buildings. They developed it in triumphal arches and their own form of temples. Particularly in interiors, where they developed it in public baths, palaces and temples, working out all kinds of new motifs with this classical language. So when in the 14th century Italy, there was this dynamic reawakening of interest in ancient culture, from the pile of philosophical and religious texts to delve into, there was also a substantial archive of ancient buildings and much more complete than today. And this showed what perfect, balanced, harmonious architecture was like. So every architect worth his salt went off to Rome, and I say his because I don't know of any female ones, went off to Rome to study, measure up and make drawings of it. And to go with this physical archive, there was a textbook that they found by a Roman architect, Vitruvius, which laid out all the theory. So the major project for Renaissance architects was how to apply all this ancient knowledge to new kinds of buildings, such as palaces, villas, villas and churches. When it came to churches, the form that inspired them most was that based on the circle, such as the Pantheon that we've seen, and many others, which although they may have been in ruins, still had sufficient presence to stimulate great interest. Now, why would they have been so taken by this form of building? Most architectural historians between, say, 1850 and 1950 would have agreed with Nicholas Pevsner when he wrote about the Renaissance churches that a central plan for a church is not an otherworldly, but a this-worldly conception. There the, the is there a problem? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm just gonna carry on. I heard a funny no noise. Yes, everything's fine. Okay, thank you. There, the spectator must stand in the middle, and by standing there, this is Pevsner, 
he becomes the measure of all things. The religious meaning of the church is replaced by a human one. The form, it was argued, represented a paradigm shift from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance of humanism, exploration and individualism. And Leonardo's drawing of a perfect man in the most perfect geometric shapes, the circle and square, seems to support this idea. However, Rudolf Wittkover, a great architectural historian, said in the 1950s that this was a naive view of the Renaissance, and he backed up his position with evidence from many artists and writers, including Leon Battista Alberti, the most influential theorist of the early Renaissance. And his argument, that is Wittkover's argument, was something like this. Beauty, and this is Alberti's conception, beauty was a quality of such harmony that you couldn't add or subtract or change anything without spoiling it. Vitruvius had explained that if you wanted to make sure that a building was beautiful, i.e. well proportioned, and all its parts perfectly harmonized, you should use the proportions of a well-built man. Such a man with arms outstretched fits exactly into the most perfect geometrical figures of the circle and the square. So Leonardo's drawing was an, obviously an interpretation of this idea. And there were many studies like this by him and by Piero della Francesca and Albrecht Dürer done at the time to show or extract these perfect proportions, even interestingly of women. Other studies relate this perfect man to the form of buildings. The drawing again seems to, uh, that's the one on the right particularly, again seems to suggest, uh, seems to support the idea uh, expressed by Nicholas Pevsner that the religious meaning of the church is replaced by a human one. However, says Bitkova, these artists and architects, as all Christians, believed that man was made in the image of God, and thus those perfect proportions and geometries embodied God's harmony, the harmony of the universe. A church using them would embody God's perfection, thereby doing what Alberti sought, evoking sublime sensations and piety and enabling divinity to be revealed. It was a very intellectual conception. The revelation would come through the mind, not through experience of the material world. And this is undoubtedly because Renaissance architects, like their sophisticated patrons, were reading not only Vitruvius, who expounded on these ideas, but also the ancient Greek philosophers, and especially Plato and the Neoplatonists. We know that Plato was very disparaging about artists, architects too, but more so artists, because he said all they did was imitate something which you could already perceive with your senses. And that was already an imitation of a pure, unchanging idea that lay behind all phenomena. So works of art were twice removed from that unchanging truth. This is perhaps easiest to grasp, or at least I find it easiest to grasp, using the example of a circle. We know that the circle we see with our eyes is imperfect. A billiard ball expanded to the size of the earth would have mountains higher than Everest. And even blowing up uh, Leonardo's seemingly perfect circle on the computer shows it to be less perfect than we thought. It's got bumps and wiggles in it. However, the idea of circularity is perfect. So if we want a church so filled with God's perfection that it sparks these sublime sensations and deep piety, it will be as close as possible to that abstract truth, that pure and perfect circularity. Therefore, according to Alberti, it should stand alone elevated out of ordinary life. It should not make any compromises with the senses in terms of color and decoration, 
but be white and pure. The windows should be so high that you cannot see any sign of the changing imperfect world outside, and it should be roofed with the dome, the most perfect geometric form, given further cosmic significance by being painted as the sky. All serious Renaissance architects and artists embrace these ideas. So this is a series of church plans based on the circular geometry by Sebastiano Serlio, who wrote one of the seminal treatises, treaties of, of the time. And numerous people, including the great Leonardo, who has his fingers in everything, produced studies for the design of circle-based churches. Many variations were built, but the church which came closest to meeting almost all Alberti's requirements was this one, Santa Maria della Consolazione in Todi, which is quite close to Rome, um, and which, interestingly, Edward Saunders showed in his beautiful slides a couple of weeks ago. You can see that it's very close in design to Leonardo's sketches. that it stands alone high above the everyday and that it combines the geometries of the sphere and the circle. Oh, sorry, the sphere and the cube. <laughs> Plan shows the perfect geometry of circle and square and in the interior, you can imagine how beneath the dome you could feel connected to the center of everything. It's difficult to feel in a sort of smallish place like that, what it would actually feel like. So one has to use one's imagination. Generally, the most perfect version is held to be the little Tempietto by Bramante at the believed site of St. Peter's crucifixion. And as, a, as you can see in the plan on the left, it was intended to stand in a circular courtyard, uh, thus representing the center of the cosmos. The elevation on the right shows it clearly based on the classical Roman temple, uh, circular temple, but a, a, a new version of it. I think you'll agree with me that it does have considerable gravitas for such a small building. You can see it's not in its circular courtyard, but with its perfectly ordered base and steps, elegant, beautifully spaced columns and balusters, its hollow drum and hemispherical dome. It certainly seems to represent the abstract idea of perfection with integrity. Every part of it, every line and molding and projection seems to be honed down to the exactness you, uh, that you can't imagine how else it could be done. Having said that, I do find it uncompromisingly intellectual, much more head than heart. And there's a gentler version of it in Verona. It's a, it's a bit later, 20 years later or so, by its outstanding architect, San Michele, the tiny Pellegrini chapel. It's more graceful and humane, with something of the feminine in it, perhaps, while in every detail, idea of the perfection being sought. Now it was in Bramante's time, the early 16th century, that the Pope Julius was putting a lot of resources into building the new St. Peter's in Rome, and Bramante was one of the many great architects employed in his design. He set about designing a giant version of the Tempietto and produced this most beautiful plan which combines the Greek cross symbol with the perfect geometry of circle and square. And you can see how he elaborated the basic form with, with four smaller versions arranged around it, all fitting into the form of a square. Witkova described it as a plan that would generate a building of absolute serenity, expressed through the divine stillness of the geometry of the circle which leads man to God. We obviously have to use our imagination to turn that plan into that timeless space, but I think you could probably see what he meant. And the coin uh, uh, on the right, 
which was cast at the time, gives an idea of, of what it would have been like. You can see it was to be dominated by the oneness and perfection of the dome and framed by two towers. Sadly, Bramante died before much was achieved. And Michelangelo took over at the age of 72. And he thought it was such a commission to be working on, he did it for free. <laughs> you can see that he retained the centrality of the plan, but modified it. Increasing the dominance of the main dome, making one side of it at the bottom distinctive as an entrance, and creating of the interior by simplification, a potent sculptural oneness and unity. It's of gigantic scale. Many would consider too gigantic. The height inside the dome is 110 meters. That's a 37 story building. And unfortunately, it was covered inside with the decoration of a later architect, Moderna. As one historian wrote, it came to symbolize the pomp and worldly power of Renaissance in Rome. And it's true. It does feel so grandiose and enormous that it's difficult to relate to and difficult to connect with the story and message of Christ. However, there are times when it's filled with thousands of pilgrims from around the world, when its hugeness seems appropriate to embody the idea of an all-encompassing God. The best place to see it as Michelangelo would have, uh, in, uh, as Michelangelo intended it, is from the back. And there you can appreciate that he didn't aim for an austere, orderly serenity like Bramante, but replaced that with one of vigorous sculptural power. And he accomplished that with this giant order of pilasters, which are the column-like flat columns, which go up several stories and create the scale of giants and also with alternating bays of different widths and with several different sizes and shapes of windows and niches. There's no doubt that the idea of oneness, centrality and unity are still there in the dominance of the dome and the consistency of sculptural intensity, but it's a unity of passion and majestic strength rather than of purity and stillness. And it's one which incorporates tension and and discordance, such as in the detailed design of niches, which at the time would have been considered almost bizarre. And just to give you an idea of that, if you look at the right hand one, just below the curved pediment, there's the beginnings of two columns that sort of suddenly stop off, making sort of like little teeth. That's a very odd thing to do with, with the classical language of architecture. So there's a lot of a t a tension and, as I say, discordance in it. But anyway, that's another story that I'm not going to pursue now. It was badly compromised when the same Moderna added a long nave onto the front. And that hides the dome, reduces its dominance and the church's unity. Of course, it wasn't only Moderna's fault, this compromise. The need for a nave was an old one. As we know, the centralized church, whatever its embodiment of God's perfection, was not suitable for the rituals and processions that would be acted out there. So because of this, another major project for architects at this time was to achieve this perfect unity in a church in one that combined length and centralization. And they used two main strategies. Finding ways to use the refined language of classical antiquity in this new building form in its interior and especially in its front and using rigorous mathematical systems of proportion. So going back in time again, see how Alberti does it in the design of the front of Sant'Andrea in Mantua. He combines the motives of temple front. I'm going to point at risk here, but temple front, here's the temple front, 
with its pediment, its entablature and its columns. So it's combining the temple front and the triumphal arch. And you can see the triumphal arch on the bottom right, and you can see that being employed also in the way that this is devised in a short length, a wider one and a short one with, with a big arch space in the middle. And this whole uh, facade uh, and all its parts, as you can see on the top right, uh, was ordered with the geometry of the square. So it's a whole series of squares that are connected with each other. So it's using that combination of the tried and tested classical language of architecture coming from Greece and Rome, combined with this very rigorous system of mathematical proportioning. We've discussed the divinity perceived in proportional relationships of the human body, but there were two aspects of the idea of divine truth in mathematics that really stimulated architects and artists. And the second came from one of the great rediscoveries of Pythagoras and his discovery that there's this exact relationship, mathematical relationship, between the sound of a string when plucked and the length of the string. That musical harmony corresponds to exact spatial relationships expressed in whole numbers. It was, and remains for me anyway, a staggering revelation, and especially for architects, that by using mathematical ratios of pure numbers related to musical in intervals, they were really ordering buildings according to universal laws of the, of the universe, God's laws. And one architect who did this was Andrea Palladio. He worked chiefly in and around Vicenza and Venice and was a great student, twice visiting Rome to measure ancient works and doing these incredibly precise drawings of their every part. And almost all of his buildings are guided by these mathematical ratios, right down to the smallest parts. It's important to understand in this that it didn't really matter whether you could see these relationships or not. Indeed, it's very unlikely that you could pick them up with your eye. What matters is that they're there, whether you can see it or not, the building, in a sense, is soaked in universal truth. If you go there, whether you think about it or not, you will experience something of the essence of God. That was really the idea. Palladio used these ratios for all buildings, not just religious ones, and his most perfect example probably is the the villa, the Villa Rotonda at Neva Chancer, which you can see is an entirely centralized structure proportioned all to mathematical uh, musical ratios. However, I want to spend a little time with his church of the Redentore in Venice, which was built in thanks at the end of the Great Plague of 1576, which killed 40,000 people, nearly a third of the Venetian population. So it's rather relevant to be looking at it now. The end of the plague is celebrated each year with a bridge that you can see here to the building over the Giudecca uh, Canal. Now, as Witkova showed, he found here, Palladio, a resolution of two of the problems facing Renaissance designers. The first was how to use the classical language in a long basilican church with a dome at the crossing in a way that resonated with the perfection that they wanted to achieve. So rather than trying to make the long nave part and the central domed part flow together as one space, he treats them as separate but linked identities. And you can get some idea of that in the plan. I've pointed out, this is the nave part and there's the domed central part. 
And you can see he uses the, the way he turns this around the corner and around the corner. And he does the same at this end, which makes that feel like when you're in there, a complete entity. But then this is also replicated here and here and here. So that when you're in here, this also feels like a complete identity. So this, the, the nave in this photo is looking towards the entrance and it's built like a typical hall of a Roman bath so with a simple barrel vault and lesser cross vaults connecting to what are called the thermal windows up at the top there. At each end is this bay, which turns around the corner and gives a sense of completion. And when you're in the domed part, it also has a sense of completeness, with the dome presiding as pure and white and holy as Alberti would have loved. And looking towards the altar, you can see again how the two parts are treated as separate units and how that end bay of the nave completes it, but also completes the domed part. However, they're also joined into a unity by continuing the treatment of columns and horizontal bands all the way around both of them. And integrated into this spatial composition would have been the unseen but profoundly present system of mathematical proportion based on musical harmony, altogether producing what Witkover called its unparalleled solemnity. And one should pause for a moment and think how wondrously calm this would have seemed, what a balm its stillness and perfection would have been after the ravages of the plague. Exactly at the same time, mid-16th century, Mimar Sinan, a great architect in Istanbul, who had had connect, uh, contact with Palladio, was designing centralized mosques in Turkey. And in fact, he was the main person responsible for developing a mosque in which the dome was a dominant feature as an alternative to the hyperstyle type that we've looked at earlier. Accordingly, according to most authorities, the dome, which together with the minaret became the distinguishing marks of Islamic holy places, were both taken over from Byzantine churches. But another possible source, at least in Persia, was the fire temples of the, Sas of the Sasanian Empire of the third to the seventh century, which also had domes on a square Base. You can see it hasn't sorted out the pendentives yet. <laughs> However, it's not always clear how these influences work. What comes first, the form or the idea that generates the form? And usually it's a combination. And in this instance, there are passages in the Quran which suggest that it was the case here. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. As one writer puts it, where light filters in through domes and suffuses the area of the mihrab with radiance, this is a deliberate metaphor of spiritual illumination. Well, whatever the origin, it was incorporated into new Islamic buildings from the earliest times. In the Temple Mount, uh, of Jerusalem, which is the oldest extant Islamic building, it was used in its most suitable way, really, to mark out a sacred spot. And it also appeared in mosques with hyperstar prayer halls, most prominently over the mihrab, in other words, signifying the most holy part, as well as in other important positions such as the corners. Now, we saw how uh, the Muslims in Constantinople happily took on the domed Hagia Sophia, and Sinan made a point of how it, had how it had inspired him. And it was he who made the main prayer hall as a domed space. And the great Suleiman Mosque in Istanbul is a very good example. If you look at the light and elegantly decorated interior, 
it seems that the order he was reaching for was rather less abstract than his Italian contemporaries. But we do know he was aiming to embody the perfection of paradise. Early texts and the inscriptions on the building itself describe its dome as being higher than paradise. The light invading the dome is described as that of the divine. The whole arrangement is conceived as a house of Islam held in balance by the four great peers, representing the four close friends of the Prophet. Our inscriptions proclaiming God's absolute power, making it a metaphor of the cosmos. And the Qibla wall is inscribed with the attributes of God and its stained glass and ceramic panels of flower motifs speak of the garden of paradise. I haven't seen one, but it's quite likely that a geometric analysis in terms of proportion would bear fruit here. Most Muslim buildings use extensively what is known as the sacred geometry, which is understood by them to make evident God's oneness and harmony. The fantastic examples in the Alhambra in Granada, where the parts devoted to religious practice were ordered with extraordinary mathematical rigor. Even this most exquisite court of lions, probably part of a madrasa, the religious school, is based on rectangles, three-dimensionally, generated by an intricate geometrical system of square roots and surds. And a surd, I have discovered, is an irrational number. So it's very highly sophisticated mathematical proportioning. The last thing that I want to say about the Suleiman Mosque is that it shows how important in creating a place of perfection is what I've called the elevated plane. And moving around the mosque, you become aware that it's only part of a whole precinct, a large walled area which you enter through gateways with inscriptions inviting you into paradise. It includes all kinds of buildings in a garden, a madrasa, a mausolea, and living and administrative accommodation, as well as a fine courtyard. And it's all held together in one plane outside of and poised on a level above the ordinary world. There you are on a higher plane of existence. Now this idea that to reach towards the perfection of God, you must move upwards through ascending planes of existence is an old one. We saw it magnificently expressed in the gradual ascent into the mountain of Hatshepsut's tomb in Egypt. And even in the Redentore, Palladio designing 15 steps to reach the entrance, thereby said that he was making the ascent of the faithful gradual so that the climbing will bring more devotion. And in Islam, as in many uh, religions, there is this concept of seven levels of heaven. Uh, paradise, so that if, you, if you're lucky or good enough to reach the ultimate one, you will indeed be in seventh heaven. The Dome of the Rock is a great example. It stands on the edge of the city. It's reached through gateways that come up from the city onto a level plain, which has further stairs onto a higher one. And the topmost plane is the most sacred, marking the hilltop and rock where Abram was to sacrifice his son Isaac, over which the dome is built. And here you are undoubtedly at a level of existence above the city and outside of all the little lives being led there. It's populated by various tombs and treasuries, as well as the dome itself, in a most poetic spare way with the elements large and small spaced 
in what seems like timeless, tranquil intervals. And cut off by its elevation and by walls and gates, it's in a position where it seems close to the sky and from where you can survey the outside world. Here, the Garden of Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives. And here, the profane world of the city. In Islamic architecture in India, there are many, many examples of these raised platforms in sacred places. And a good example is the Jama Masjid the Friday Mosque in Delhi. To get there, you scramble through the most intense piece of city you can imagine, the piece of the old city of Delhi. You come to a great broad staircase leading to a gateway and climb up out of that intensity to this quiet place surrounded by a colonnade behind and below which the city seemed to disappear where you can bring your family to escape from a claustrophobic existence. And at any time of day, you can come and have some quietude out of it all. Or you can come to worship with 25,000 other people in the broad horizontal plane of the earth, close to the sky. What a mind boggling experience that must be. the most famous sacred place, probably, the tomb built by the Muslim Emperor Shah Jahan for his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, in 1632, the Taj Mahal. It's revered so because you can experience there the most profound sense of perfect and immutable harmony. And what makes it so special? It's not simply a building. It's a great horizontal plane of precise geometry set against a great curving river. It's a perfectly square garden entered through a large gateway from a forecourt on the left, that is, the forecourts on the left. And the garden is, divi is divided by long pools of water and pathways into four smaller squares, which are further subdivided into four. It's bounded by walls and buildings at the corners and midpoints cut off from the ordinary world around. You enter through the gateway at a slightly higher level than the plane of the garden, so you can see its whole extent, its breadth and horizontality emphasized by the shining pools, and also by the counterplay of vertical elements, the tomb itself, and the four minarets which frame it and create an interval of space as beautiful as the domed building. So the garden is bound to the earth and connected to the sky. It's all in balance. The tomb and minarets are on a plane higher than the garden. In fact, there are two, a red earth platform and above it a white sky platform. The color difference makes the higher one seem to float. You can see that quite clearly here. And also how the subsidiary building, the mosque that we're looking at on the left there, is tied to the earth platform. There's a hierarchy in the form of the building. Your eye can climb effortless, effortlessly from smaller things to bigger from parts to the whole, from the small niche in the tomb to the larger to the whole, from the lower levels of the minarets to the higher, and so on. And that gives it great human scale. Although it's large, you never feel overwhelmed. And the main building has that anthropomorphic appearance of a mother with children clustered around that we've seen before. Even on a hazy day, the building has a wonderful pearly translucence and the dome the most precious shape. You feel you would like to hold it in your hands. So it's a tactile building as well as a visual one. As you go through the garden, you pass tranquil echoes of the whole place. 
markers that give you a sense of the measure of the place. Now you must rise just over a meter onto the red platform on which are set the mosques on this side, a mosque on this side and a, a matching guest house on the other side. They're of the same family as, as the tomb, but built of red sandstone and inlaid with white. Once on the platform, you already feel a different atmosphere and begin to sense your removal towards a greater reality. The tomb above, oh, sorry. So the main building is on its white platform above you. And as you move around uh, towards the stair up to it, it towers over you and you become aware of its detailed nature with its mixture of geometrical, natural and inscription pattern inlaid into the white marble. As there is a hierarchy in the forms of the building, so there is in the decoration smaller inscriptions in the smaller elements and larger in the larger ones. So you climb up and find yourself on that level. You're incredibly aware of this higher platform and the mosque seems to recede below. The gateway and the garden and the people and the trees all seem to recede below. I'm aware of the an elemental relationship with the mighty river, the perfect geometrical space against organic nature. There's a sense of suspension over everything and of a powerful connection between the earth and the heaven. Everything around you is beautiful. And now you see that what was at first sight a light texture, then an intricate pattern on the surface of the tomb. When you're close to it, it's the most spare and elegant inlay or low relief sculpture, which has the delicacy and refinement of the scale of your fingertips on a building as high as 20 stor 24 stories. Inside the tomb, there isn't the sense of the vertical and of, of elevation you might have expected. And I must confess to a little disappointment, unless you've studied the cross sections, that is, because the space doesn't rise up into the dome. It has a shallow dome at a much lower level. It's essentially a kind of semi-dark, encrusted with beautiful patterned tomb to place the sarcoph sarcophagus buried in its exquisite memorial. And so, to see the other side of it, in the early morning, you can see the little people on their two sacred platforms above the sacred Yamuna River, lifting up their eyes in wonder and harm at the perfect harmony there. OK, so that's the end of today's talk. And I will try and get out of this in a sensible way. Exit. Now. Teams icon. Thank you. Well, there are a few minutes left, so if anybody would like to ask any questions or have any comments, I'm happy to answer them. Shall I, shall I, start? Shall I start? Sure. I've got two questions. Sorry, let me just see who you are. 
I'm Kate. Oh, hello, Kate. Okay. <laughs> uh, first question. Are you doing any more tours? Um, I don't know. With COVID makes it quite difficult to plan ahead. And one gets older all the time, so <laughs> they're quite they're quite uh, stressful to 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 organise these these tours. So I, I'm not sure. I'll just have to see. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, I hope you do. And the, and the second question is, I, I wondered if there are any pieces of beautiful architecture that weren't designed to be a holy place, like a mosque particularly locally, <laughs> so we're all based here, <laughs> that um, gave you an incredible sense of something special. And it could be a museum like the Zeitzmoka Atrium. Um, it could be, I don't know, the dining hall in the Mount Nelson. No. No. <laughs> uh, but Baker I, designed. I think, yeah, I think there are lots. You know, one would one would have to sit down and think where 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 to start with it. But you know, there are lots. I mean, the uh, uh, well, whatever their origins and the, uh, for whatever reasons uh, it was built originally, the the House of Parliament in Pretoria are fantastic uh, as a space to to visit. They they're beautifully put together. A number of cathedral. Oh, are you talking about non non religious spaces? Um, so uh, you know, if, if you if, uh, they're, they're part of the city. I mean, there, there are pieces of building on the, uh, the the pieces of the UCT campus which are like that. The, um, for instance, the two uh, residences are, um, are on campus. I think are really beautiful spaces, mm -hmm. uh, where you might not feel at quite the sort of elevated level that some of these other uh, places are aimed for, but you would certainly. Um, uh, experience something of it, and so on and so on. So I think there, I think there are plenty, and I mean Palladio's. Uh, well, we've done a tour of Palladio. And I just showed that Villa Rotunda. That almost all of Palladio's buildings, you have that same sort of feeling of connection, uh, sort of amazing connection between you and something bigger than you, mm. which in, in a way I think is what it's all about. You know, it's a, so no, I think there are lots of places, castles, all sorts of places. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Anybody else? Julian, there's a question that was written in by one of your attendees. Oh, thanks. Uh, did you pick it up, Jane? Uh, where would I find that? I'll read it to you. As much as okay. the architect, could you see it? It's no. under your chat. Oh, under chat. Uh, I can't find chat here. Can you just read it, Jane? Yeah. Ivana. Ivana is the person, Julian. Maybe she can just read out her, her own question. Ivana, are you there? Hi, Ivana. Julian. Hi. So, as much as the architecture is really beautiful and mathematical, I cannot help but wonder about the practicality of the design. The spaces were created to be most practical for worship and connecting with the gods and the divine. But is there any record of architects taking the practicality of cleaning into consideration? So Sorry, the practicality of what? Cleaning. Of cleaning. I know the Court of Lions had all those sculpturing and patterning on it. I just, I cannot imagine that they actually took any cleaning consideration into that. There must oh, be dust sort of thing, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, the buildings are incredibly well built. So, um, I mean, the classical system, for instance, is really, a, a lot of it's around how you get rid of water that's falling on buildings. So there are all these little drips and, and uh, moldings and protrusions and things like that that are incredibly good at, at uh, keeping the building uh, in good shape. And I mean, that's really part of the reason that they've lasted for so long. And in fact, the sort of modern, you know, the modern so-called very practical way of making buildings, it's, it's really often, it's, it's made to look kind of functional, but it actually isn't. So. And it's the same with the, I mean, the, the, the Taj Mahal is in absolutely perfect condition, you know, and these these mosques and things are, that, that, that mosque in Cairo that we looked at yesterday is absolutely amazingly 
built. I'm sorry, I've got somebody mowing a lawn outside me, outside me. So I'm, I hope you can hear what I'm saying. But um, so I think that the, 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 uh, technically, the, technically, uh, 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 if, if, if by that you mean functional, technically they they're really extraordinary in many many ways, given the technology that they had. You know, the uh, in the in the Gothic in the Gothic buildings. Um, you know the shedding of water, getting rid of uh, all uh, 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 all the problems related to the water, the structural things, so that taking up the movement and so on in the building, the wind forces that they they are absolutely unbelievably built, really. So so I think that I think that for me, what's what's really wonderful about them is actually exactly that that it combines this terrific inventiveness at all levels through the building because as an architect you, you've got so many different things to to think about and to pull it all together in a way that it also transmits the deeper meanings that make you feel good to be a human being is you know what a lot of what i think a lot of these buildings are doing yeah so <laughs> i hope that helps a little bit it does thank you so much Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else anywhere? I don't see any more hands. Um, I'm just scrolling through. See if there any hands are coming. Should, should we end off there then, uh, Zuleika? Let me just check finally. The, okay. I don't know where. Okay, I'm just looking. Oh, there you go. Okay, chat. I'm just looking. Oh, there's somebody. Please tell us about that Elizabeth Handy Vitkova. Please tell us about Vitkova. Not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Elizabeth Handley is asking, please tell us about Vitkova. Oh, uh, Vitkova. Yeah. Well, um, look, I don't know an awful lot about him, but he, the, the, there was, uh, uh, just, just before the Second World War, there were a number of absolutely outstanding German uh, architectural art historians who left Germany because of the onslaught of the Nazis, and they went to different parts of the world. And one of them was Rudolf Wittkova. Um, so, and he he wrote this book, um, Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism, which I think is a really outstanding little book on on the Renaissance. And 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 a lot of what I've been talking about today, almost all of it, comes from there. And he he really uh, revolutionised people's thinking about the the architecture of the Renaissance and this whole business of centrality and so on. Uh, through the uh, kind of argument that I've I've tried to put to you to, to today, but of course in much much more uh, uh, careful and scholarly de scholarly detail. So he also wrote a book on um, uh, Palladio and Palladianism in England because Palladio P Palladio probably had has had more influence around the world than any architect in history. Um, certainly in all the colonial places. And I mean, anywhere anywhere where people have used the classical system, there have been elements of Palladio in it. So he was incredibly important. Um, and Witkova wrote the book on uh, the spread of his influence in England, which which is an, also an excellent book. So I think that if, if you want to read a little bit of architectural um, uh, theory and history around that, that those sort of periods, He's a good person to start with. Wonderful scholar. Anybody else? No. Okay, so I think we, I think we should stop there then. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be looking at some modern churches, mainly churches, ch churches and one temple. Okay. Well, thank you, Julian. Thank you very much. Presentation. Okay.